up until 3 and 4 in the morning at the meetings, and then up again at 7 and 8 to go to work, and we were not tired. Reverend Alistair MacDonald joined the chorus. And usually we did not return home until early hours in the morning, but still we went to work at 8 o'clock, not without feeling tired. One seemed to have supernatural strength. In Duncan Campbell's reports, he says, on several nights the meetings continued until 3 or 4 in the morning. <coughs> Buses came to collect people for a concert in the town, but they returned empty for not one person went. I addressed five meetings today, he said. We simply cannot get the people away, and the meetings just continue on till tomorrow morning. People are here from every parish in Lewis and Harris. So deep is the interest that during my visit to a certain district, all work stopped on the day regarded as a Sabbath. Meetings were held during the day and night. Yesterday, buses brought people to certain districts. Others came by boats, but most came over the hill and more by foot. Very few cars in those days. So eager were they a few nights ago on the hearing that we were to be at a certain church at 11 o'clock at night, they secured buses and arrived an hour before the service, filling the churches, filling the church, so that the people of the district, when they came to the church at 11 o'clock, had to remain outside for two hours. We had a praise meeting this morning at 1.30. At 4 o'clock this morning, we were assembled at the shore, singing the praise, songs of Zion as the boats carried them across the sound to the main island. Four o'clock in the morning. One of the elders, he said, assured me last night that every person on this island, I think it was Brother Harris, uh, every person on this island who could be out was in church. Fighting the clock on them. Preaching. What about his preaching? Norman Campbell says, Duncan Campbell was a fiery preacher and he preached the full gospel. At first he preached the law and the judgment, then he would go on to Jesus as the Savior. Mary says, every night now I walk to the church to hear this preacher thunder forth the judgments of God. He stormed up and down the pulpit, expounding scripture, preaching damnation to the lost and salvation to those who repented and savingly believed. I knew one thing, this man was sincere. <laughs> Maggie Mary remembers the preaching had been searching, but the night the Bible broke out in Arnold, it was simply overpowering. The Holy Spirit was applying the word to so many hearts as we listened to the intense presentation of the gospel. The, the text rang out again and again, and thou, Capernaum, who art lifted up to heaven, will be cast down to hell. And the preacher applied the word personally. You, the word personally, you are here tonight, and you have turned your back on God. Once, twice, even three times you have said, and are continuing to say to him, I don't want to know Christ. You have been lifted up to heaven. You will be cast down to hell. And the power, the power of the Holy Spirit was overwhelming. The sense of the presence of God bowed all our hearts. <coughs> Duncan Campbell preached from the heart. His preaching was practical, plain, personal, passionate, penetrating, powerful. He spoke to the heart with tremendous authority and boldness. Andrew Woolsey says, there was nothing complicated about Duncan Campbell's preaching. It was fearless and uncompromising. He exposed sin in its ugliness and dwelt at length on the consequences of dying and li living and dying without Christ. Mr. Campbell's messages were on were on paper, written on paper on walls, bits, bits of paper of different sizes, scribbled notes, uh, scraps. They weren't written out in detail at all. He would simply write a word to remind him of a particular illustration. So nobody would understand the scribbles where, which were his messages. They were in Gaddon. And Mary, my wife, had mercy on him and took the scraps of paper, sorting out the material as best she could, and with his help, and comments printed them down clearly in an exercise book, all in Gaelic. We have the exercise book there. It's preserved, the, the, they are preserved the, 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 in this book. Now, each sermon would take up about a page or two of A5. That's all he had to preach. It would consist of three or four headings with a few explanatory notes uh, under each head. At the side of each sermon would be the dates and times when it was preached. We have this preserved, a record not completed in, in any means, by any means, of the sermons preached in the various places in which he ministered during the divine. But as we worked together on this, on this thing, and Mary uh, translated, 
it, it was absolutely amazing, the simplicity, the absolute simplicity of the preaching. It was just filled with scripture, scripture, quotations, quotations, quotations. But the, the matter, there were no Greek verbs and, uh, explained. There was no theological concepts unraveled. There was, there was no detailed analysis of biblical pa uh, passages. He was just preaching his heart. And he had plenty of scripture stored in his mind to fill the words which he was speaking. And fill the mind of the people who listened. Preaching. Theology. Mary says, he preached on an eternity without God, on the doom of the sin, on the wrath of God, on the power of the cross, on the glory of the redeemed, on the wonders of heaven. Oh, the gospel rang forth. It was terrible in the ears of sinners, but thrilling uh, to those who responded and yielded to the Savior. It was no easy believism. We understood very well that there was a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. He preached on the depravity of the heart. People knew this doctrine very well. They'd heard it from the pulpits. Yet he applied it to the hearts and they had nowhere to hide. Sin's wickedness had ruined their lives and distorted their nature. Their lives were corrupt. Their understanding was darkened. Their hearts were deceitful and desperately wicked. They were carnal and defiled. I mean he went through it. He preached on the judgment of God. Man cannot will his way back to God. He is doomed. He cannot work his way back to God. <coughs> He cannot free himself from sin's bondage. He is defiled and cannot cleanse himself from sin. He is without hope and without God in the world. He is under the terrible wrath of an almighty God. Clear. He preached on the several sovereignty of God. Because uh, in that area, sovereignty is made much of. And he preached it. He, but he said this. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I do not believe in a sovereignty that nullifies man's responsibility. Very interesting. He said, in his sovereignty, God has given to man responsibility. He never actually led people to the Lord. He never made appeals. There were no appeals made in those. Come to the front to seek God. No, that wasn't happen. That didn't happen. <coughs> they sought God. The presence of God drove them to seeking God. Seeking God. The conviction of, of the Spirit of God drove them out and they sought God. He would at times clear a room and have an after meeting and pray with them. So we have the depravity of the heart, the judgment of God, the sovereignty of God. Uh, holiness was another emphasis. Because when you come into the presence of God in revival, you are dealing with a holy God. And that comes through the holiness of God. God is holy. And then he emphasized prayer. This was always to the fore. Prayer was at the heart of the whole movement. Margaret MacLeod, remember, said, it was a community of prayer. Whew. Those are marvelous words. See, if my people humble themselves, seek my face, and so on. If my people, 2 Chronicles 7.14, you know that verse. If my people, not just a few here and a few here and a few there of my people, but if my people, the community, the community was praying, God answered. Two old ladies prayed, yes. The men in the barn prayed, or the house prayed, but it was a community. They were united with one heart and with one voice. God, come, come, come. Then, um, the afternoon. The afternoon. Duncan never led people. He got, got them, he would, for instance, the, the house would be filled.